Well, I'd like to thank first the chairman of the National Unification Advisory Council here in the UK for this kind invitation to speak to you today, uh, which I regard as a great privilege. Thank you very much, sir, for inviting me here today. And I have to say this is a, an extraordinarily exciting moment, I think, as I've uh, examined Korean history now somewhat. I think the apology offered by Chairman Kim Jong-un uh, just a few days ago is unprecedented in um, the dialogue between DPRK and ROK. It is an extraordinary moment, and I think it perhaps indicates a new dynamic and possibility for serious dialogue and negotiations about a shared future. But we will see how this plays out over the coming weeks. I suspect it will be more a matter of weeks than months, but we will see how this develops. And I hope this discussion today will contribute into this um, active discussion and debate about a possible future and uh, present some fresh ideas to some of those present. Um, I'm delighted, having had a quick look round uh, who's here today, uh, to recognize a number of familiar faces. I wish I could greet you all personally, those I know. And of course, a lot of new faces, people I don't know. Uh, it's always a challenge speaking to people you don't know, but um, I will do my best to um, communicate something useful in this time. Thank you. So uh, just moving on then to um, my next slide, I hope. Um, you've already heard from uh, my colleague Peter here about our previous work in South Africa and so on. I suppose I want to stress that um, I don't see Korea's problems as in any sense unique. Um, our work in South Africa was between a very right-wing capitalist government on the one side and a very left-wing um, socialist or communist even party on the other, the ANC, and trying to find mutually accepted solutions on things like the ownership of the mines and the banks um, and the ownership of the land itself. So we're no stranger to how you have to find new approaches to areas of sharp difference in particularly in the area of economics and business finance. Um, but also other countries have also chain, um, faced profound ideological differences. So when we worked in um, Sudan, North Sudan is Islamic, of course, and has much higher incomes. South Sudan is Christian and has much lower incomes, but much greater resources, natural resources. In the same way, in a sense that you could say, well, DPRK has much greater natural resources, but much lower incomes, at least at the moment and South Sudan has much higher incomes and a much um, better economic track record. But how do you bring countries so different together? And, and basically our position is that sustainable peace and harmony, peace alone is not enough. We believe there must be harmony, social harmony between the publics of both countries. And we're suggesting a way to achieve that is through a shared relational worldview that is distinct from both communism and capitalism, or I should say Korean communism or socialism, Korean socialism, Juche, and Korean capitalism, as a policy framework for the transformations of organizations and society. So you might then say, well, why now? Why is this such a strategic and important moment? And I would give you two or three reasons why I expect to see things happen quite rapidly. The, second, the first is that, um, that it appears that there is a new Cold War developing, this time not between the US and Russia, but between the US and China. Now, we obviously don't know how this is going to play out, and obviously we don't want it to develop into a Cold War where 30 or 40 years there's a kind of standoff and for influence in the world, but it appears to be moving in that direction. And the longer that trend continues, the more difficult a solution is going to be for Korean unification. And I'm sure that's as clear to DPRK 
as it is to ROK. The last thing that these two administrations, or whatever you call them, these two administrations, whatever you think of them, they're both long-term strategic thinking organizations or administrations, and they neither of them want to see the DMZ as, the, as becoming like Berlin in the Cold War between the, um, the West and Russia. Secondly, the effects of COVID-19 are dramatic, particularly on the economy of both DPRK and ROK. So the DPRK economy was already in deep trouble after tri triple level sanctions. And at that point, 94% of its imports and exports were coming to or going to, coming from going to China. Uh, now, um, that's now just down to a tiny it's a tiny proportion of what it was back in January of this year. It's an, in, in a nosedive because of COVID. So DPRK's got two, DPRK has two big problems. It has the problems of the triple sanctions and it has the trouble of problems of COVID. And now it's been hit by a third problem, which is the typhoons and the flooding, which is going to give it probably one of the worst harvests for decades. So, how do they survive such an immense economic uh, set of catastrophes, one after the other? And for ROK, don't think ROK will get off lightly out of this because its exports, it's a very export orientated, export led economy. And if the exports are going to be hit by COVID um, all over the world, especially obviously to the West uh, and also to China, China takes 24% of its exports at the moment. That's about a quarter of its total exports. And if the Chinese economy is reeling from the problems of um, the difficulties with the US and so on, and the effects of COVID, it's a very difficult time for ROK economically. What, where is it going to go to find fresh impetus and fresh, fresh dynamic? And there are always also the risks of military conflict. We shouldn't underestimate whether it's from some uh, accident, from some military officer, from some over-enthusiastic individual, or whether it comes from some um, deliberate attempt by some group to um, stir up problems, we shouldn't underestimate the possibility of conflict. So the next question I want to ask is, well, why do we believe it's necessary to involve the US, China, Russia, and Japan? And I suppose it's not a complicated question uh, in a sense. Um, the short answer is that you just have to involve them because you need sanctions exemptions for any flows of finance and trade between DPRK and ROK. If there's ever going to be some form of unification, there's got to be some type of convergent development between the two halves of the country. And that cannot happen as long as there are sanctions in place. How do you get sanctions exemptions to allow that trade and, and allow those financial flows to happen? Well, you need the UN Security Council, the US, China, and Russia are all on the Security Council, but you also need Japanese involvement. They're a major player in East Asia. They influence the thinking of the US substantially. I'm sure they influence the thinking of China and Russia as well. So all of these countries, all the original six countries, in a sense, are involved. Now, we in RPI are firmly of the view that the Korean question needs to be resolved by Koreans. It isn't for the West to dictate to Koreans what future they should have. They must decide for themselves what they want. That is the absolute priority for DPRK and ROK together to sit down and talk about what future they want for themselves. No other country should be telling the Koreans how they operate and what their priorities should be. They have to decide those issues. But at the same time, they have to do it in a way that gains the support of these other countries if, the, if it's to be realistic. That's our position in RPI. So why not go for one country, two systems? Why bother with unification? And again, I suppose that's a short answer to this. Uh, and that's um, Hong Kong. That was set up to be one country, two systems, and it lasted uh, from 1997 to sometime close to today. Uh, that's about 20 years. Certainly it didn't last 50 years. 
And I think if you want a sustainable solution, then you have to go beyond one country, two systems. And while I think a confederal solution, that is with two systems and two parties coming together in a confederation would be a possibility as a short term measure, I think it's only feasible and worthwhile if it's part of a journey towards um, full unification. There needs to be a pathway and a journey towards uh, full unification, we believe. And uh, we are arguing for that pathway to be a pathway of economic and social convergent development. So we are wanting to avoid dominance. Um, we don't want to consider um, what some people talk about, which is unification by absorption. Because you can have unification by absorption, which happened, of course, when East Germany was absorbed effectively into the West German political and economic system. But the trouble with that is that today, 30 years later, when they did surveys in late 2019, after 30 years after the Berlin Wall came down, and they asked East Germans, well, how do you feel about it now? According to The Economist, a full 47% of East Germans say now, that's at the end of 2019, that they identify as Easterners before Germans. And that's a far higher proportion than at the euphoric moment of reunification. In the end, the East Germans still feel different from the West Germans. They never feel as if they've been fully taken into account, fully heard, whether that their values and ideas and the positive sides of their culture. They just feel it's been swept away. They don't feel it's been taken on board by the West Germans. They're just forced to operate within a, a West German mindset and a West German ideology and economy. But there were positives in East Germany and they resent now the fact that, that they were not heard. So I think there are benefits to both DPRK and ROK of convergent development. Those benefits uh, are clearly there in the economic sphere, whether it's in the sharing of um, natural resources and labor resources and financial resources, or whether it's in the sharing of skills and technologies and ideas. And what we are looking for is an economic and social convergent development strategy, one that brings the two countries more and more into alignment with shared goals and shared ways of thinking and looking at things as a pathway to achieve viable unification discussions. We think those are necessary steps to get to those unification discussions. That's um, the position uh, that we have adopted in RPI. I just want to underline how much ROK needs some new thinking, some radical new thinking to break some very destructive trends. Now, South Korea, as you probably know, um, has the most remarkable economic record in the world. It is the only country that in 60 years has moved from being one of the poorest 10 countries in the world to being one of the richest 10 countries. It is an extraordinary achievement but it has been at immense human cost, and that is often forgotten. If you look at these figures, you can see that the birth rate in South Korea is lower than anywhere else in the world. It's now, according to these figures, which come from Statistics Korea, it's now at 0 0.82. Now, the replacement rate, that is the rate at which you need to have children for every married woman, or every woman, I should say, every adult woman, not married woman, for every adult woman, you need an average of 2.07 children per adult woman to simply maintain the population at an existing level. If you go down to something like 1.3, which is where Germany is, for example, or Japan, then either you have a shrinking population, and you can see this now in Japan with huge rural areas of Japan now completely empty, closing rural hospitals, rural schools, and so on, 
because there just isn't anyone left to live there anymore. Or you have to import large amounts of labor from somewhere else, which is what they've done in Germany. And the trouble with that is that you cause a great deal of political instability. It is really vital that South Korea does not become extinct. We're not talking about an extinction rebellion here. <laughs> We're talking about an extinction actuality. So within, by, by 2060, the workforce in South Korea will have gone from um, where it is now, about 38 million, um, down to about 17 million. That's even with its aging population and older people working a bit longer. That is a fantastic drop in the size of its workforce, unless something happens to begin to pick up um, the number of children that women are willing to have. And you're not going to change that by just giving women $1,000 to have a child. It doesn't work like that. It's much more profound than that. And that's, in a sense, a talk for another day, um, Peter and uh, your chairman. Perhaps we could address it another time. But I think also that you have to realize that another, um, this is another statement from The Economist, I think these are OECD data, that South Korea also holds the international record for the number of suicides, not something perhaps to be very proud of, both um, among teenagers and particularly among old people. And they're so much higher, as you can see, in South Korea than, than China or Japan or Hong Kong, and very much higher than the OECD countries. So these su suicide rates are really a matter of shame. Why are so many old people so miserable? Is that the kind of society that South Korea really wants to create? I very much doubt it from all the South Koreans I know as a caring people, they must be seriously anxious about such figures being in the public space. So how do you get out of these sort of problems? And we believe that um, both for the sake of ROK and DPRK's own societies, because DPRK has its own severe social problems, as you're aware, we think that a foundation for mutually agreed convergent development could be something like this. Now, obviously, we're not Koreans in RPI. We are coming as, if you like, friends of the Korean peninsula. So we're coming with ideas and suggestions for Koreans themselves to discuss and think about. But our suggestion is that um, <clears throat> uh, that um, you need a statement and national measurement of the relationships at all levels of society being the primary goal of national policy. What are you ultimately trying to achieve? Well, yes, you're interested in the growth of the economy, but in the end, life is more than money, more than clothes, more than food, as Jesus himself once said, <laughs> a famous spiritual teacher. Money is, it, life is more than food and clothes. It's something bigger and more important. So we're suggesting that the relationships in a society at all levels, that is between individuals, between families, between communities and cities and regions, between companies and organizations, and ultimately between the nation of Korea, of Korea and other countries, all of those need to be thought of in relationship terms. And that will inevitably result in economic growth and benefit because relationships are also a foundation of successful companies, successful schools, successful health service. Every part of society ultimately depends on the health of relationships among its stakeholders and organizations and right down to the grassroots of individuals and families. So we see uh, relational thinking as not a middle way between capitalism and socialism, but a different and transformative approach to national policy design. And you can see it here in this picture. Uh, and I haven't got time again to unpack a great deal of um, what um, relational thinking involves, but it does argue that 
you not only need a different goal as to what you're trying to achieve, but you also need a different thinking about how you achieve those goals. It's not a matter of violence and revolution. It's a matter of dialogue and finding common ground, shared goals and interests. It depends on people getting to know one another, building trust with one another. And that takes, of course, time and contact with one another as well. So a, a rather Korean idea this, I think, um, but it's also a relational idea that a good society is defined not by abstract ideals, but by how it connects its members by human connectivity. That's about networks and systems as well as personal relationships. But human connectivity is crucial, we believe, to achieving a good society. To have a good society, you need a, an, an agreement about shared values. It starts with defining what constitutes your shared values. So um, we did some research over the last six months, particularly to think about what are the main sources of values in the Korean Peninsula, and could we identify shared values? Now you'll find some of this already on our website in the um, resources section, as we are putting out papers on this at the moment, you'll find a, a summary of the first three of those papers on that website. But these are the six main sources of values that we identified. Um, what we've called Korean capitalism, which is quite distinctive, of course, from Western capitalism, and of course, much more successful as well, if I may congratulate the Koreans present. Um, it's also uh, about Korean socialism, Juche, which is quite distinctive from other forms of communism and socialism. It's informed by Korean ideas as well as by Western ideas, it's not simply a Western implant. But also these religious ideas influence what people think are important. And those ideas are shamanism, which has a very long and deep history across the whole peninsula, um, and Buddhism, and Confucianism, Neo-Confucianism in this case, and Christianity. All of these are big, frameworks of thinking and ideas. So we looked at all of those and we said, well, where are the shared values in those six, uh, six systems or frameworks of thought? Where are their shared values? And we came up with five. Here are the five, which we believe are held by the majority of people in both DPRK and ROK. These are things that Koreans, all Koreans, think are important. Now, they may put a different stress on different parts of this. Uh, there may be particular circumstances in which they find it difficult to apply them. But if you say, do you believe in these things? I think pretty much everybody would say yes. Mutual duties and responsibilities. It's not about individual rights, what society owes me, as in the West. It is about mutual duties and responsibilities, what we owe each other, what responsibilities we have to each other, and what, they, what responsibilities they have to us. Uh, loyalty and faithfulness, you see it particularly in Korean concepts around family. Compassion, generosity, and kindness. Uh, I think the Korean people are some of the most generous people I've met in the world. <laughs> And I've traveled pretty much to every part of the world. Um, I lived in North America. Um, I visited on my travels um, large parts of Africa, I did peace work in Sudan and Rwanda and South Africa. I lived in Kenya and Uganda for eight years. Uh, I worked in Tanzania as well. I visited Australia and Hong Kong. I've been in many, many parts of the world, um, but I am amazed at the generosity of Koreans that nothing they enjoy doing more than giving people presents, and I've been a beneficiary of many presents on my, in my time, I have to say. And then fairness, justice, truth, and tolerance and respect for everybody. 
And I think that last value is important as you enter a peace process because what people need to know is that their ideas will be respected. There may be different differences at many points, but everybody needs to be heard. Everyone's ideas need to be on the table if you're going to find ways forward. And we don't believe that's impossible, especially when there is a very powerful economic dynamic to encourage people to achieve progress. And here is a possible statement of national purpose. Now, again, I want to stress that this is not intended to be <laughs> normative in some sense. What we're seeking to do in RPI is to stimulate a discussion, a debate. And we hope that if you read these ideas here and also in our papers, that you will respond to them. You will send us your thoughts and reflections. We'd love to hear from you. We can't guarantee to reply to everybody, but we'll try because we think it's important that Koreans themselves are deci deciding what is their national purpose. And we've suggested this statement as a possible statement of national purpose. To build healthy relationships between all people, each of whom has equal worth, across society as a whole, and between people and the environment. I suppose it all sounds great at one level, but how on earth do you achieve that in the modern world? How on earth do you bring mutual understanding and respect? How do you build that mutual understanding and respect? I said it would take time. You cannot instant, you cannot create an instant, deep and trusting relationship. You just can't do it. Relationships need time. Time is the currency of relationship. You have to take time to build understanding and respect. So how do you go about what? What is the process to achieve it? And, and we've suggested um, a five point strategy, which we call the mutually accepted, it must be by both DPRK and ROK, a mutually accepted economic and social convergent development strategy. And there are five key components. It should be over a period of seven years. Um, it should um, involve the gradual opening of trade and financial flows between DPRK and ROK. Two-way flows, north to south and south to north. Sector policy consultations, so sector by sector, starting perhaps with agriculture and then the health sector, the education sector, the finance sector, the business sector, transport and infrastructure sectors, education, and so on. All of these sectors need to be um, leaders and policymakers on both sides need to meet and talk about, well, what kind of goals and policies do we agree on for that sector? There needs to be an exchange of students and professionals, and there needs to be involvement of international investment and technical support. Every country benefits, every country, in the world that has achieved um, economic growth and development in agriculture in every sector has used international knowledge and techniques in order to achieve that growth. And I don't think Korea can hope to escape the need for that kind of international connection and, and wisdom and knowledge if it's going to achieve optimum performance in any area of its public life. So the end goal, after seven years of discussion between DPRK and ROK, it should lead on to discussion about possible forms of reunification. I don't think it's appropriate to start that on day one. There needs to be a problem, a period first, of building of trust towards getting to a point where you can have those discussions about unification. But nor do I think it's right to put unification on the back burner and say, well, it doesn't matter really if it happens or not. I think it does matter. It does matter a huge amount if there is an end goal that everyone is seeking to achieve. Everybody is working together towards a shared objective. Um, a new national constitution, a new national political framework, which everybody feels comfortable to buy into. 
It's not impossible to achieve that. You might say, well, can't it take 20 years or 30? And we're saying, no, it's difficult. It can't be too short a time. It can't be three years because that's too quick. But if you aim for 20 or 30 years, people lose focus on it. And also it assumes stability in international relations in the world that probably it is foolish to assume at this point. Now, if you're going to start this process, what is the main stumbling block you have to overcome and how do you overcome it? And um, this is another really tough question. I'm sorry to throw so many <laughs> major issues into one short talk, but the main thing we believe is that you have to achieve the exemptions from the UN and other international actors exclusively, or at least to include, but I think ideally exclusively for trade and financial flows between DPRK and ROK. Now, we're suggesting in the book we wrote uh, on this, published in November last year, which is available from our website, both in English and in the Korean languages, we have suggested that they should be given only for trade and financial flows between DPRK and ROK. They should be given um, step by step after both ROK and DPRK agree on shared goals for a sector, then they get entitled to sanctions exemptions for trade and financial flows for investment and activity in that sector. Once they've agreed what they want together for that sector or the whole peninsula. And also um, we've suggested that um, that it is only for this relationship between DPRK and ROK, because it, otherwise, if you open up DPRK's trade to the whole world instantly, let's say tomorrow, and you give them those sanctions exemptions for the whole world, the difficulty will be that the relationships between DPRK and ROK that come out of shared economic activity, shared investment, shared trade, all of those things won't happen because DPRK's relational capital, if you like, will be spread globally and not focused on ROK. And similarly, ROK has to focus a great deal of its economic activity and its investment into DPRK to achieve these goals. Why should the UN support this approach? Well, I think the fundamental argument to the UN is its founding charter. Its founding charter back in 1945, 1947, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact date, <laughs> is that, that all peoples have the right of self-determination. Now, the people of DPRK and ROK are all Koreans. They've been Koreans for millennia. This is not some new, uh, newly devised um, boundary that we're talking about. This is a long, long set of relationships in history and goes back at least for a thousand years in its present form, except for the break in the last 70. And what we're suggesting is that the people in the Korean Peninsula are one people. They speak one language. They fundamentally have one culture. Now, there are differences at the edges, but there is an enormous amount of common ground between uh, North and South Korea in their culture, their language, and the way they view life. And as I say, despite the last 70 years, I think it's easy if they wish to come, if they start, wish to start moving towards each other, we think it's easy for them to argue, look, we are one people, and they can say to the UN, we are asking you to support our appeal for self-determination, to enable self-determination. And we think the UN has really not much option but to agree with that. Why should DPRK agree with this? Well, basically the same reasons that ROK should agree. Firstly, to rebuild friendship with dignity. They want a framework which allows their ideas, their thinking, their history to be taken seriously and listened to. 
They want to re-energize their economy and they desperately need that for the reasons I've given and to avoid the consequences of a cold war with themselves caught in the middle of it. And the same with ROK. They also want to rebuild friendship with dignity. They don't want to abandon what they've learned. They don't want to have abandoned their modern economy, but they do want to rebuild friendship and that will require compromises, both by DPRK and ROK to achieve that. They do need to re-energize the economy because otherwise the South Korean economy will go backwards in the next few years. And that's always difficult to live with. It leads to unemployment and a lot of misery. And people begin to wonder, where is our society going? It needs a fresh purpose and direction. And the possibilities with DPRK are so huge, given DPRK's natural resources and the possibilities, that it will re-energize the people and the economy, we believe, substantially. And it avoids the consequences, again, of the war. Now, you might be thinking, well, why should the US give support to this? And this is, again, you may want to ask questions about it. It's a much bigger uh, discussion. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of communication with the US over many years. The work we did in Sudan actually was partly funded by the State Department back in the early 2000s. Um, and um, we have a lot of contacts in Washington. My PhD was at Cornell University in the States, and I've been in and out of Washington with the World Bank and the International Food Policy Research Institute. I'm familiar with the United States. And the US obviously is focused on this issue. But it is clear at the moment that it isn't going anywhere. And there is a problem that, um, the, the, the US is running out of options. I mean, in 2017, apparently, it was, there was discussion, we've heard, it's only rumor, of course, um, that there was a plan to drop 17 nuclear bombs on North Korea. I have no idea if that's true. But as soon as you start to think about it, you realize what the implications of that would be and how China would respond to it today if that happened, let alone how DPRK would respond. So to achieve denuclearization of DPRK, perhaps you need to follow a different route. It needs to follow a route of what we call de-isolation, encouraging DPRK to engage with the global community, to realize that there are a lot of friends out there that it is able to build and develop and that it doesn't need to be so isolated. And there are ways to manage this denuclearization process that does not threaten its own internal security. I used to wonder why DPRK was so almost paranoid about its security. But one North Korean I got to know quite well, um, a diplomat explained to me that if you'd lived in a country where every city had been bombed by the US uh, Air Force, so that in Pyongyang, there was only one building left standing by the end of the inter-Korean war, then you realize how threatened they feel by US air power and why they feel it's so important to fight, have some deterrent. But the deterrent is only useful if you are under threat. And somehow DPRK needs to be brought to a point through building of trust, which again is a relationship type of issue, it needs through the building of trust to feel less isolated and less threatened by the US and the international community. And that needs dialogue, sustained dialogue and investment and the building of trust. From a US point of view, there is also the danger of an unpredictable end game, which is dangerous. Uh, just think about Iraq after the Iraqi war and how unpredictable that was and the lack of planning for that end game was a disaster for the US. And also the US, I think probably is already reflecting on the fact that the only way really to maintain its strategic interest in East Asia 
is to think about the Korean Peninsula as a possible buffer state, rather like, um, rather like Switzerland was in the Second World War. Between major powers, Switzerland acted as a multi-connected, neutral presence in the middle of Europe. Now, lastly, um, why should, uh, or what are the implications for our okay? I've got two things there. So I'm just um, struggling to find where I am in my notes, forgive me. There we are. Um, I think actually I missed something. China. Yeah, I miss China. I mustn't miss China. They are such a huge um, presence in this whole situation. Why would China give support to Korean reunification? Well, I think there are three reasons here. Uh, again, please ask questions in question time, and I'll get my colleague probably to answer them for you. But um, obviously, there's the One Belt, One Road initiative. They're really interested in developing their communications networks um, eastwards as, as well as westwards. And they need a modernized infrastructure in North Korea. They need a peaceful North Korea. Also, uh, given the political stability issues in its northeast provinces, uh, China needs political stability in DPRK. And an economic growth that is connected to appropriate confidence building measures in the military nuclear area would increase political stability in DPRK enormously. And I've no doubt that China, like the US, can see the benefit of the Korean Peninsula becoming potentially a unified um, buffer state in the region, which would be able to trade with everybody and uh, act as uh, a mediating force when necessary. So finally, since this is sponsored by um, a South Korean initiative, in a sense, um, the challenge to South Korea is, is it really willing to restructure? Um, it means a change, I think, in school and university culture, which is deeply individualistic and competitive. Somehow the, sh the culture of competition, fierce competition, at school and university needs to give way to a more cooperative culture where people are helping each other and not just only trying to help themselves. I, I do wonder, I have to say, whether it's really fair on children that, that many of them seem to work 12 hours a day now at school or studying from a very young age, as young as six or seven, um, that really raises big ethical questions for me. And then there are business and corporate governance issues, um, the environmental and social uh, governance criteria now being used in the West, um, all sorts of issues around stakeholder engagement, all of this kind of language and thinking, which is now moderating the behavior of large Western corporations needs to be considered in the South Korean context. And then there are changes needed in the families, in the, the financial system and in family policy. Maybe there needs to be a minister for the family in ROK to consider all government policies, all corporate policies from the perspective of how they impact on relationships between relatives and the wider family because that's got to be a priority if you're going to change this low birth rate. And of course, in external relations, these are big challenges to ROK. And um, there is a question of willingness to restructure. And I think if the prize is high enough, if the prize is a unified career and all of the business and financial opportunities that would go with that, and all the possibilities of peace and harmony and simply of bringing the nation together again. I think my own view is that in DPRK as well as ROK, people will be willing to make substantial changes to their internal systems and structures to achieve that. So I'm gonna stop there. You can see I'm an optimist and I look forward to your questions and your feedback. Thank you. <laughs>